welcome to the latest episode of Talking Europe on France 24. I'm Catherine Nicholson. Now, whether you're a Europhile or a Eurosceptic, you will probably have heard the same criticisms of Europe. Too bound up with bureaucracy, a Brussels bubble, supposedly unelected officials calling the shots for half a billion people. Well, recently, the sceptics got some new ammunition in the shape of a lightning-fast promotion of a lifelong civil servant called Martin Zellmayer to one of the most powerful jobs in the EU. Well, more on his specific case in a moment. On today's programme, we'll be finding out why so many lawmakers here at the European Parliament are up in arms about that case, but also asking whether the critics might not have a point and if European institutions across the board might not have a little work to do to make their work more transparent for ordinary citizens. Our guests today are from Estonia, Indrek Tarand with the Greens Group. Thank you for being with us. You're also Vice Chair of the Committee on Budgetary Control. True. <laughs> from Germany, Arndt Kuhn, who is with the uh, Socialists and Democrats Group. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. And uh, from Luxembourg, Frank Engel of the European People's Party, uh, which has the most members in Parliament. Uh, Mr Engel, you're also a member of the uh, Committee on Civil Liberties, Justice and Home Affairs, if I'm right. Yeah. Well, let's uh, first bring our viewers uh, up to speed on this latest uh, case that sparked the transparency tussle. This comes from our Brussels reporting team, Alex Le Bourdon and Maeve McMahon. He spent the last few years in the shadow of his mentor, Barely known outside Brussels, Martin Selmar is now at the heart of a major controversy. The 47-year-old German has been the Chief of Staff of the President of the European Commission since 2014. But recently, he got a new job, that of Secretary General. An express promotion that's turned heads in Brussels, especially that of Jean Quatremer. The French reporter, who's been based in the EU capital for over 20 years, was one of the first to denounce the move. It's not possible to recruit a secretary general in just three weeks in these conditions. The procedure takes much longer than that. You have to go twice before an advisory committee, then an external consultant and then have an interview with the commissioner. So the rules must have been twisted or even broken and that's not normal. But at the commission's daily press briefing, the same argument has been repeated for weeks. Pour um, expliquer. So I'm telling you, for the umpteenth time, the most simple thing. The legality of our procedures has been respected down to the smallest detail. But this is not enough to reassure the storm that's made its way to the European Parliament. Frankly, we are shooting ourselves in the foot. An opinion shared by this organisation that fights for more transparency in the EU institutions. There is a problem with the political culture in the, Euro in the European Commission uh, and they, they really have to fundamentally uh, change that and, and, and they have to start right now. And that is a tradition of allowing Commission officials to be far too close to, uh, to big business and lobbyists from big business. He's referring to another case that has shook the same institution. It relates to its former president. Jose Manuel Barroso is now suspected of working as a lobbyist for Goldman Sachs. Meanwhile, the European Commission maintains that transparency efforts must be made in all EU institutions before the 2019 European elections. Right, there we go. Plenty to talk about in uh, what's been called Zellmeyer Gate by some. Uh, I'd just like to ask each of you uh, about your position first then. Uh, we did hear in our report that Margarita Esquinas, the spokesman for the Commission, said all the legal procedure was followed in this case. Uh, Mr Tarrant, if I come to you first, uh, why isn't that the end of the story for you? Why isn't it that the end of the story? Well, because all the legal procedures seem to be a um, little bit invalid. And uh, a secretary general is a really powerful bureaucrat, a top bureaucrat. I've been secretary general for myself for 10 years, and uh, I can imagine the, the extreme power you can exercise from that position. And if we quote um, Commissioner Vice President Mogherini, we want the best and the brightest. So you cannot uh, have appointment like that without a proper public concours. Uh, Mr. Cohen, I know that in the plenary debate at the Parliament, uh, you said that uh, this case gives people the impression, that, at least, that the regulations are being stretched, the rules are being bent, if mm -hmm. not broken. Uh, why is uh, what's happened with Mr. Zellmayer not acceptable? 
from my point of view as a citizen, it's really hard to understand how this procedure could be right, because we have uh, yeah, not a really transparent way of promoting him for this job. Mm -hmm. I don't know how long the commissioners were informed mm -hmm. to decide this job. That's the question. That's one of my questions I asked to the commission. And um, yeah, if we have these rules and it's within the rules, I think it's not only the case to keep the rules. Mm -hmm. In these times of criticism and populism, mm. it's not our duty to keep the rules, is to, yeah, to inform the people and to let them know what we are doing and to be transparent. Uh, Mr. Engel, I know that your party, your group rather, the European People's Party, uh, seems perhaps a little split on this issue. The official line is uh, to defend the Commission's right to choose whoever it wants. However, um, I spoke to one vice president of the Commission, Mr. Katainen. Mm. He said that he and the <coughs> other vice presidents weren't aware that this was happening. No, because because it was obviously not something that had been um, that had been debated in 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 college. Be before it appeared in college as, as a fait accompli, and, that's, uh, and, that, and that seems problematic to me as well. Um, look, I, I, I start from the assumption that, in principle, there should be somebody in the Commission, they have enough collaborators, um, vaguely knowing their own rules uh, for, an, for an appointment like this. And if I, li and if I listen to Margarete Skinas, I have to assume that, in principle, they're telling us that, after all, everything is fine. Martin Zellmeyer does, have the for does uh, fulfill the formal conditions for the appointment as, sec uh, mm -hmm. as Secretary General, which seems to be the qualification as uh, Director General. If that is so, the only question that I'm asking myself is, why did they not just appoint him? Under very normal and transparent circumstances, the moment that the, pre that the previous Secretary General announces his intention to, uh, to retire. That a Secretary General of a government, and the Commission is a government, mm. well, a, a is, question... is, is, is a political appointment. Sorry, I'm not naive enough to, uh, to, 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 to question that. The Secretary mm. General of the French Cabinet is not somebody that has nothing to do with the people that are currently in charge. That is probably <clears> the same thing with every national government that we can, can contemplate. That it's so in, in the European Commission does not shock me. What angers me is that we are faced with a procedure which obviously, as it unfolded, is questionable and it should not be. Well, I think you've all mentioned, uh, or most of you have mentioned something, that this kind of adds grist to the mill for the Eurosceptics um, and uh, for people within the European institutions who want to defend Europe. Uh, we had the likes of uh, the UK Independence Party's Nigel Farage saying this is the perfect stitch-up, talking about nepotism, unaccountable government. Uh, if the would, European would Union would never needs... happen in UKIP, I suppose. <laughs> if the European Union needs to heal its image a little bit, uh, how, how can it do that work, Mr. Cohen? Because this does seem to have been quite damaging. Well, I think that some people feel confirmed. Mm. And um, it's our, our common goal, I think. It's the goal from the Commission and our goal in the, in the Parliament to confirm people not of what they are thinking about Europe, mm -hmm. we have to confirm them of our work, mm. of what we are doing in Europe for them. And I think this case is yeah, doing the opposite. Mm. And we have to avoid these cases. Is there perhaps some hypocrisy as well uh, from the critics of this? Uh, the former commissioner and current MEP Danuta Hübner has said herself that the European Union, she thinks, is more transparent than actually the national governments uh, of she's, the member states. She's wrong. Why would you say she's wrong? Mr. I would Tarrant? say she's right. She's wrong. <laughs> let's well, let's, let's hear from it you out. first. <laughs> well, she is a former commissioner, and uh, I think in last parliament we had a problem with her uh, cooling off or something like that. Uh, also, I hope this is fixed by now, but um, uh, you're right in saying that, um, that they all sort of Eurosceptics and uh, people who don't like European Union's idea can use these kind of cases to criticize Europe as, mm. a, as a community. Well, they as certainly a, have done already. Yeah, but um, the thing is that um, what I regret is uh, that also inside the parliament we are quite slow and reluctant to reflect on our own habits, on our own ways of procedure. How mm. do we decide Zellmeyer or how do we decide... Um, Klaus Welle, or how do we decide 
anybody here in upper rankings. Mm -hmm. And uh, the parliament could be the trigger uh, of, of sort of making the processes and rules better mm. when we start with the famous um, uh, Yes Minister Sir Humphrey's slogan that uh, everything starts, you have to castrate yourself first. I mean, if you make your house in order, you have a moral ground to demand from the others. Mm. Right now we don't have. There's something which is called gentleman's agreement. Yeah. We don't stick our noses into each other's business. And that I think should be finished because no one has seen those gentlemen recently. Well, at the same time, I mean, uh, a gentleman's agreements, as you say, uh, if they're not written down, then that can leave a lot open to interpretation. At the same time, though, do we really need more regulations, more processes in Europe? Uh, if I come back to you, Mr. Engel, uh, in terms of transparency, I mean, are we fighting sort of against human nature here? <clears throat> yeah, we probably are. We, pro we probably are, and that's, and that's difficult. Um, not, not so long ago, we also debated somewhere the, uh, um, the new occupation of uh, the former president of the European Commission. Now, that the president of the, of the European Commission that had to uh, try and handle the biggest financial crisis since 1929, mm. which was precisely brought about by the likes of Goldman Sachs, afterwards goes and joins, joins Goldman Sachs, is something which I believe the most fundamental individual decency should prevent from happening. Well, Obviously, that decency was not present. So do we need new rules, case. new laws? We, the, 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 the laws are relatively strict already, and um, the, the, the strict ones that we have allowed him to do that after, what is it, two or three years? Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm not in favour of, 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 of establishing with the force of the law somewhere that if you have been president of the commission or head of government, right, and what, uh, you're never again in your life allowed to hold certain, certain privately uh, remunerated functions. But I would so hope that at the end of the day we would bring ourselves to just not doing things that must seem revolting to ordinary members of the public who try to make ends meet at the end of the month and who, and, and, and who just believe that we're all busy all day long with just filling our pockets. Mm. Well, Mr Kuhn, I know that you, uh, you spoke about uh, an amendment aimed at ensuring that future application processes for, for postings uh, within the institutions mm. are more transparent. I'd like to come back to that point. Uh, we said, you know, laws, procedures were followed in this case. Who's to say that new laws, new procedures will be followed in the spirit of those laws and procedures in future? If it's really the case that uh, all the laws were followed, we have to improve the laws because um, we all agree, I think, that it wasn't uh, transparent and a, and a good way to find a new man for this position. Mm. So, and I'm on your side, Mr. Tarrant, when we talk about new rules, it's also for the parliament mm. to find new rules and for the council as well. And when we talk about transparency, I, I agree with the, with the position that the commission did already a lot. When I look at the German Bundestag, I cannot find a transparency register which we have in the European Commission. Mm. But I think we can do more. We, it's not only uh, who the commissioner talks with, it's also who his, uh, his staff and the secretary is talking with. Well, I'm sure we could talk about this sort of quite a lot longer. Radical. Unfortunately, we are out of time, <laughs> but uh, lots of issues indeed about uh, lobbyists, who MEPs are talking to. I'm sure this is going to go on for some time. Thank you all for taking part in our debate. Just before we close off the programme, I'd like to move on to our regular look at fake news that's been doing the rounds around Europe. Now, uh, our latest episode uh, talking about the EU's sanctions on Russia. A news piece from the Russian news agency Itartas, published in January, has raised a few eyebrows in Brussels. According to Itartas, Bulgaria, the current holder of the rotating EU presidency, would be ready to reopen the hot topic of EU sanctions against Russia at a forthcoming ministerial meeting. Those very sanctions that were adopted after the annexation of Crimea by Russia in 2014. However, the announcement by Itotas was formally denied by the Bulgarian presidency. So, 
aware that this rumor come from? Well, there is indeed a meeting with Russia which is scheduled for early April, but it will be meeting at technical level, not at ministerial level. And most importantly, the question of sanctions is off the agenda. That said, the Russia sanctions remain a political hot potato for European countries, especially Belgium, France and Italy, because they penalize the farming sector. But for now, they have always been renewed unanimously the last time in December and until the end of July. Brussels sources suggest that the announcement by Ito Tass is probably part of a strategy from Moscow to divide the EU next time the sanctions come up for renewal. A strategy which for the moment has not yielded the expected results. Europeans have even found renewed solidarity recently in the ongoing dispute between London and Moscow over the poisoning of a former Russian spy. Frederick Simon there with our latest uh, Fact or Fake here on Talking Europe. I'd like to thank my guests once again, Frank Engel and Korn and Indra Taran. Thanks all for taking part in our debate. Thank you very much for watching and do stay tuned. More European news coming up for you very shortly on France 24.